Welcome to the show. My pleasure. There are so many people who have seen your TED Talks about relationships. There are so many people who have read your articles about sex and the way we see sex in the world and how it applies to our daily lives. When you look at everything that has happened post Harvey Weinstein, what do you think we're learning about sex and power? Sex and power are interdependent. They are interconnected. There is power in sex, and power can be sexy. But there's a difference between power to, which can be liberating and enhancing and affirming, and power over, which can be oppressive and hurtful and demeaning. Right. What we are seeing today are abuses of power. You know, and that's a very different situation. When I write about infidelity, I write about a consensual story. When I look at assault and uh, harassment, I'm looking at a criminal story. Those right. are very different realities. What has changed is less the accused and more the power of the accuser. Whenever people, children, women have been violated, they've worried that they wouldn't be believed. And what it takes is people who have enough power to withstand the forces of denial. Wow. If you, if you look at the conversations around sex uh, and denial and the ideas that we all face, it, you know, some people would say sex is a subculture of what we do as human beings. You have an interesting view, and that is you, you see our cultures and our societies through the lens of sex. What does that mean? It means that every culture, its most rooted traditional archaic values are surrounding sexuality and its beliefs and attitudes about sex. And the most progressive, radical changes also take place around sex. Every civilization tries to control sexuality, license and abstinence. You need some sex or there won't be a species. Right. You can't have too much of it or nobody shows up for work. <laughs> Now, when, when, when you talk about the state of affairs in the book, especially infidelity, it's such a powerful topic, especially in America. You know, just recently we saw a, a, a congressman where a tape came out of his infidelity and people asking questions around what does it mean? And, you know, obviously he had said different things in public, but it really is a powerful position where the story was then flipped and people were like, is it about the woman or is it about the man? You speak about how, in many ways, infidelity and the issues we're learning about now display to us the power dynamic and the way women have been oppressed for so long. How, how do we learn that or how do we see that? So the first thing is infidelity has never been a gender equal proposition. Men have practically had a license to cheat with all kinds of theories that justified why they have, it's in their nature to roam. And women have faced dire consequences and still have nine countries where they can be killed. So this is about sex and power actually. Right. Um, that's one of the big differences is what is changing today actually is that women are rapidly changing the infidelity gender gap. How, 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 are, they, how are they doing that and is that a good thing? Well, what it tells you is that women have basically behaved by virtue of the dire consequences of what could happen to them. Ostracism, pregnancy, destitution, uh, and even death. And right. so once she has more economic independence, once she has no full divorce, once she can control her own reproduction and she's no longer worried that a baby's gonna come out nine months from now that whose color hair doesn't resemble hers, she may be more... You may, you may learn more about her desire than you right. actually have learned about her throughout history, which has been her compliance. Now... You, you hear stories of, of people saying... Like, a, a good example is Mike Pence. Before the Harvey Weinstein scandal, everyone laughed at how Mike Pence would always bring his wife to a meeting if there was another woman, and he said, I won't be alone in a room with a woman. And people said, this is, this is madness. And then after Harvey Weinstein, people came out and said, well, you see, this is why he's doing it, to protect him from infidelity, to protect him from making these mistakes. Is that a good argument in how we should tackle the, these scenarios? But what, what, is the, what is the argument? The argument is an age-old argument that says men 
are biological creatures in perpetual motion in search of an outlet. They can't control themselves, and it is the woman who has to be his border, his boundary, and his full stop. Right. The women's bodies need to be covered, hidden, haircut, you name it, in order for him to be able to control his lustful urges. And she is helping him to do so because the poor man can't do it on his own. <laughs> You if, know, if he strays, it's because of her, because she was so seductive, she was the temptress. Right. You know, it, the poor man, he's never in charge of anything. He's got power galore, but he's never in charge of his own urges, because she has to control them, and otherwise she didn't do a good job at it. That's, that's an interesting point, because, I mean, we saw that in the election. You know, we saw people digging back into the world of Bill and Hillary Clinton, where people went, Hillary, she didn't leave her man, she stuck with him. And, and you talk in the book about how the shame has always shifted, but it is always on the woman. Shame used in what ways? So, it used to be that divorce carried all the stigma. Today, especially for a woman, choosing to stay when you can leave is the new shame. So, not only are you betrayed and you're ashamed of being cheated on, but on top of it, you have to lie about it, because if you were to reach out to people, and especially if you choose to stay with that person, right. you are triple under the, on the uh, triply accused. Uh -huh. And it is more of a pressure on women because today that we choose our one and only, that notion that it shouldn't happen, I waited so long, I picked my soulmate, when you deceive me, lie on me, cheat on me, etc., you shatter the grand ambition of love. It means I'm not your one and only after all. Right. And affairs have always been painful, but now they have become traumatic. When, when you talk about the state of affairs in the book, Rethinking infidelity is, is a blasphemous term for many human beings. Uh, people will say, Esther, how can you? Infidelity is the worst thing that could possibly happen. Anyone who cheats, anyone who's in a marriage where it ends because of cheating is the worst human being possible. You argue something slightly different, not condoning, but arguing that there can be a good that comes from this. How? So, I wrote The State of Affairs because I think that we need a new conversation for the oldest sin. Any audience... I could ask here, have you been a child whose parent was unfaithful or left for somebody else? Have you been the offspring of an illicit love? Are you the friend who, that somebody has been weeping on? Are you the confidant? Or are you one of the three primary protagonists? In the end, 80% of this audience will say that they have been affected by the experience of infidelity in their lives. Right. So it's not a few bad apples. And for that, we need a conversation that's more caring, more compassionate, and doesn't just reduce everything in black and white, which doesn't mean to say it's good, but it does mean to say that it is complex and it has existed since marriage was invented, and so too the taboo against it. As, as somebody who deals with couples, as somebody who deals with powerful men, as somebody who deals with a lot of these stories, I don't know if there's any right answer, but how do you see a way forward? You know, you see, like, people go, oh, Harvey went to rehab and then checked himself out. And Kevin Spacey also went to rehab. And everyone's going to the same rehab. And in Congress, they're investigating <laughs> themselves. And then they don't find anything, or they do, but it's done. And <laughs> it, it seems like there, the, there is a quandary that people are in now going, like, well, what is the way forward? Is, is there rehabilitation? Uh, should it be complete ostracization? Just from your point of view, do you think that there is something that we could be doing in society to restore a power balance? Is there something that we could be doing... To, to, to equalize how women are treated in all of these environments? But uh, let's establish something. Um, the rehabs, there is no rehab for infidelity. You know, and this is a way of kind of... We used to be sinful. Today we have s illness. And it is the new frame. So we can pathologize our s behaviors, <laughs> you know, and make ourselves be sick suddenly. What is it, what is it actually <laughs> that is going to be treated in that place? You right. know, you're, you're, you're acting criminally and you're going to get help. For so um, I think that we have to separate these two are not the same reality. Right. The story of infidelity. One of the very important changes today is, you know, interestingly, affairs have accompanied marriage regardless of the model of marriage. Mm -hmm. They were part of the patriarchal marriage, they were part of the romantic marriage, they're part of the new self-actualization. It always has existed, and it involves for us to ask questions about the transgressive nature of desire, not just about power. 
you know, I, I, when we think of affairs, it's quick to think about your Congress guys. But uh, I get a letter today of, you know, my spouse has MS, my spouse is bedridden, I'm taking care of my partner, I will never leave my partner, and I've had an affair for the last four years. That's a very different reality right. of infidelity. And to just make it be about people with no conscience and narcissistic people or people who, amongst the many things, have also been unfaithful, right, doesn't right, help right. us understand the complexity of this very multifaceted experience of, of, of our humanity. Well, thankfully you wrote a book because it's one of the most fascinating conversations to have. Thank you so much for being on the show. The State of Affairs is available now. It'll blow your mind. You can also listen to Esther's podcast, Where Should We Begin on Audible? Esther Perel, everybody.